Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Training Thursday edition of the Cabral Concept. Glad to have you here today, where we are going to talk a little bit about nutrition, a little bit about exercise, a little bit about intermittent fasting, but overall, making sure that you understand that there are limits to how little you can eat. And I think you've probably experienced that by now. It's like, how much can you diet? How much can you reduce the calories that you eat per day? How long can you go without carbohydrates? How long can you go fasting on a daily basis? Eventually, you break, you give up, and that's understandable because what you are doing is deprivation. You're putting your body into more of a survival-based mode. You are hurting and suppressing thyroid-based hormones. You're creating estrogen dominance for both men and women. For men, you're dropping testosterone levels, potentially decreasing growth hormone levels when it's done chronically. So my goal for you today is just to get you to just look a little at the equation a little bit differently. You know, there's more than one way to solve an equation. And what I like to do is help people with short-term results, yes, but also a long-term plan, no doubt about it. Because the long-term plan is what ultimately allows you to stick with it and maintain your results for life. And you're a whole lot happier because it's not all about deprivation. So I'm not going to say that there's no work involved at all. I'm not, I'm not that type of hype person. But I just want you to know that there's a limit to manipulating macros. There's a limit to how long you can do a daily intermittent fast on a daily basis. There are limits to how low you can drop your calories for a certain period of time, right? How many meals you can skip. So what I really want to get uh, the point across today is that there are often easier, simpler ways to do things that can be maintained for the long run, and they're dramatically helpful. So let me just make sure here that you tuned into this show. So it was, it was just yesterday's show. It was episode 2049. Hopefully you're tuning in daily. Of course, that would be helpful. I, I would love that. One, of course, love the support for the show. But really, we're trying to just teach one concept per day, and they build off of each other, right? You can go back. You can listen to any show independently. That's not a problem. All previous shows are at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. But what I talked about yesterday was a lot of people wanting to burn some body fat. A lot of people want to get rid of the bloating, right? The extended stomach. Uh, a, a reader wrote in and, and wrote, called it lower belly bulge. Sorry, let's try that again. Lower belly bulge. And, and I thought it was a great term. I'm like, okay, that makes sense, right? You don't want to bulge in the lower belly. I, and I gave you the different reasons that it could be. Well, so what I want to share with you today, though, are the main reasons or the main ways that you can lower blood sugar, which is so important. I mean, it's so important not to have low blood sugar, but normal blood sugar. I talked about it last Friday on the podcast. I've been talking about it a bit. I mean, after this week, we'll pretty much, we'll be done. I'll have felt satisfied for a while that I've taught enough on blood sugar because you don't want low and you don't want high. You want balanced, right? It's always about dynamic equilibrium. I mean, more people are using that word now, which is great. But it was there for hundreds of years for a reason. And it's because the body is always in flux. Like if you look at your blood sugar, you know, it's like 83, 87, 85, 72. And, and it should always be within a normal parameter, but it's dynamic. It's dynamically balanced, right? Because your body's always doing things to add a little bit more, take some out, right? Add a little bit more with glucocorticoids or food uh, or take some out with insulin and your receptors in your cells. So... And I know that's overly simplified, but it's, it's the foundation, right? That's what you need to know. You don't need to know more than that. That's how it works. So what we're talking about, though, is what happens when you either wake up and your fasting glucose is above a 95 on the uh, parameters of 70 to 90, 70 to 95 milligrams per deciliter. And I would even say if it's above a 90. What do you do? Well, we'll teach you that. And then what happens if two, three hours after a meal, your blood sugar isn't back down to the normal 70 to 95 milligrams per deciliter. So that's what I want to go over here today. Why does it matter? If your blood sugar is more normalized, you're going to have less inflammation. You're going to have uh, less aging. You're going to create what are called less advanced glycation end products. You don't need to know what that is, but you're going to have less inflammation, less free radical damage. That's a good thing. You'll have less of a chance for Alzheimer's and dementia, less of a chance for gaining body fat, better chance of burning that body fat, better energy, more stable energy levels, better brain cognition. So believe me, the uh, benefits are almost endless. Balanced blood sugar leads to balanced health. So that's what we're talking about. So 
It's as simple as taking your fasting glucose in the morning with a glucometer or continuous glucometer. If you don't know what a continuous glucometer is, I spoke about it last Friday on episode 2044, and I also spoke about it on episode 2041. There's no pressure to get one at all. You can also use a $20 continuous glucose, I'm sorry, $20 glucometer. And those are at stephencabral.com forward slash resources. You can literally just prick your finger and you'll get your blood uh, sugar. So the one way to use uh, the stephencabral.com resources page, because it's about 150 of my favorite resources in this field, um, you can just press command F on a Mac and then type in whatever word you're looking for and it will, it will search that. All right. Let's get started. So the first way to lower blood sugar in a natural way is this. Okay. Let's say that you're testing your blood sugar during the day and it's basically always elevated, but you're someone that likes to graze throughout the day, right? A little bit of snacks, no big meals, just kind of snacking all day long. Or you're someone that likes to do three meals and you like in between meal snacks. Maybe it's like 8 a.m., 10.30, 12.30, 2.30, 5.30. Maybe those are your meals. Oh, you're, you're in a pretty good time frame, uh, but you're eating five times a day, even though the other two are snacks, right? It might even just be a coffee with cream and some sugar. Well, it still counts as eating, right? Because that's still going to spike blood sugar. So what I'm saying is anything between a meal that has calories in it at all uh, counts. So what I want you to do is this. This is the first step, and this is a game changer. Ayurvedic medicine recommends this in adulthood, is that you eat three meals a day, and basically only three meals a day. Now, the Vata body type dealing with hypoglycemia, they do say the snacks are in there, and I agree with it, right? But you should be working with a practitioner if you're doing that. So the truth is this. If you are more than 20, 30 pounds over your ideal weight for you, uh, you really want to just do the three meals per day. I mean, you really do. Because what we need to do is get that blood sugar back down to fasting levels before the next time you eat. And then we need a period of, um, of intermittent fasting, which is going to be typically five, six o'clock at night uh, till 12, 14, 16 hours later. I'm telling you right now, I'll talk about this on a different show. My absolute best night's sleep in terms of REM, deep sleep, and HRV are always when I stop eating early, four o'clock, five o'clock. So if I'm not with my family and I'm traveling, I might stop eating at four o'clock that day. I've done that before, especially if I have night flights home. I'm not going to eat airplane food. So I'm like, no, we're just, I'm going to have my lunch and I might have a little snack at uh, 3 4, and that's considered my dinner. That's it. I'm done. And then I go until eight o'clock the next morning or so. So what did I do? Well, it's 16 hours, which is normal for a lot of people. Uh, but what I'm saying is this, is that it's the more hours before bedtime that matters. The more hours before midnight is what seems to matter. And it's being backed up by a lot of people in our field. Uh, because again, the people doing the work now are always always way ahead of the research studies and the textbooks. So, but I'm what I'm always saying is you can track this for yourself on an aura ring or another device as well. But anyway, um, we want to move to three meals a day. So we want to make sure that that blood sugar drops down between meals, and that means you want four to five hours between meal. So it takes two to three hours for most people for their blood sugar to fall back down to normal levels. Ideally two two to three for a lot of people. So if you eat at 8 a.m., it should be back down by 10, 1030. Now you're not going to eat until, let's say, 1231. Okay. So then it's up until about three. Okay. And then you're not eating until, let's say, 530. Great. So you've got your four to five hours between meals. It falls down for a couple hours between the meal. Blood sugar is normal. And then again, you're fasting for 12, 14, 16 hours overnight. So uh, it's the easiest. It's the best way to do it. Do make sure that you're combining all of your meals into three meals. So if, if you love certain foods and snacks and you're eating it for your total calories per day, no problem. Just add it to the meal before, right? That's it. Just add them. I mean, that, that's really it. It's going to be the same amount of calories, and instead of having your glucose up and down all day long, now you can have it only up three times per day. All right, so check that out. And, and believe me, if there's enough fiber and protein at that meal, uh, you'll stay satiated. You won't need the extra food uh, every, every couple hours. You might just take a little getting used to. Also, check out my podcast on this. I did it a few years back. It's called Why Three Meals Per Day, and it really explains this outline as well. Um, State-of-the-art science meets Ayurvedic medicine, which I like to study both. So the second way is this walk. You've already heard me say this before. 
walk. Walk after you eat. Now, I'm going to give you a different thing besides walking if you don't have the ability to just kind of get up and move if you're at work. But here's the thing. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty crazy, but my blood sugar after a meal goes back to normal faster after dinner than it does at lunch. Doesn't make any sense, except when you look that I'm oftentimes not doing my walk directly after lunch. Sometimes it was earlier before that, but after dinner, what I'm doing is I'm up moving my body, still the same basically protein, carbs, fats. It's not radically different. I'm basically, I get a protein, I've got a starch, and I've got two vegetables, and then I put healthy fat on top. Like that's that's how all my meals are structured. Um, and again, I have that inside of, uh, besides my smoothie in the morning, I have that on my, um, you know, my typical Mediterranean diet, I, I call it. So, all right. So what am I sharing with you is this, is that the scientific research shows Postprandial glucose, that means your blood sugar levels after you eat postprandial, is dramatically improved if you walk after you eat. Now, how long do you need to walk? Only 10 to 20 minutes. That's the amazing thing. So here's a couple tips. If you're home, take your dog for a walk. Your dog would love to go for an extra walk. Take him for a walk or her for a walk. All right. If you're at work, See if you can do a call while walking on the phone. I have a lot of private wellness clients, friends, family, go for a walk after lunch and they do a 20 minute call. Great, great use of your time, all right? Another thing to do is if you're home when you have lunch, do some housework that you have to do anyways. Go get the laundry, fold the laundry, moving around, um, you know, whatever. Do the dishes, <laughs> clean the floor, whatever you need to do. Move your body for 20 minutes after you eat. Now, I'm not talking about a workout. We're talking about just light movement after you eat. This is going to be really helpful, and uh, it's going to lead to better blood sugar levels, which means it won't go as high of a spike in blood sugar, which is great, and it won't be as a severe fall, or it won't take as long to come back down. Check that out. Try it. It's going to be great. One other tip I want to give you there, if your blood sugar, if you wake up and you take your glucose level with it, just again, a simple glucometer, or you scan the back of your arm like I do for that CGM, here's what you want. Okay, 70 to 89, right below 90. If you're in that range, good to go. Life is good. Let's say you were at 98. All right, it's too high. It's not where it should be. What do you do? If you can, go for a walk, 20 minutes. All right, just go for a walk. That's basically it. And it's going to help bring that down. You could say, well, I'm just going to keep fasting. You could. You could keep fasting, no doubt about it. But that might not bring it down either, depending on your stress levels. And I've done many shows on how stress affects glucose as well. All right. So take those two tips. The third one is this fasted cardio, or I shouldn't say fasted. It's just, you can do cardio anytime. It could be first thing in the morning. I'm going to explain what cardio is because it's, it's actually not the same as every form of cardio, or it could be a couple hours after a meal, or it could be even when you have higher levels of glucose. Let me explain. The, the, Cardio that I'm talking about is it's either fasted cardio first thing in the morning when you haven't eaten, or it's a couple hours after a meal. Okay. So basically you haven't eaten for a couple hours. Now, what the cardio that I'm talking about is, is aerobic-based cardio. That means steady state. That does not mean high interval, uh, high intensity interval training, sprint interval training. No sprints, no resistance workout with weights, no high intensity interval training. Do I love those? Of course I do. I do them three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Those are my resistance training days. And I'm doing basically triceps or circuits. And that's how I do mine. My heart rate's up, working my muscles, working through a, a, a grouping of exercises, resting for a certain set period of time, going back them, through them again, resting for a certain period of time, and then going back through them again, right? And it works great, but that's not the same. And when I do that, and if you're tracking your glucose, you'll often see that you get a little rise in that type of workout. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad workout because, again, blood sugar is meant to fluctuate. Don't listen to all of the people out there that say, no, your blood sugar should just stay at 76 all day long. No, that's not how blood sugar works. That is not normal dynamic equilibrium. And it actually is not always to your benefit. You actually need to be able to adjust. A healthy individual can adjust to eating carbohydrates and proteins and other foods. Very, very important. Okay. So here's what I, here's what I, I wanted to say about that. That's not going to give you typically a reduction in glucose for at least a couple hours. If you want a reduction in glucose, which is what today's podcast is all about, endurance, steady state cardio actually does that. 
And believe me, there's a time and place for steady state cardio. It is great for the cardiovascular system. It's great for your heart and lungs. It's great for circulating the blood. It's great for not creating more acids within the body when you work out. Again, I'm not against that, but there's actually two parts. Anaerobic without oxygen, aerobic with oxygen. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. And medical science is actually showing that it has beneficial effects for people dealing with cancer and other issues as well. So please don't overlook steady state cardio. I did in my 20s. I was like, because I was helping people with like elite body transformation. I mean, I was helping people. I helped celebrities get ready for certain roles in movies. I helped Olympic athletes. I helped athletes make weight. I I helped other personal trainers and their clients with their nutrition, and it was always about body transformation. So basically, we were doing high-intensity interval training before it was cool, and we were doing paleo before it was cool, and we were doing cyclical uh, keto before it was cool. Uh, you know, Now, 10, 15, 20 years later, it is. But again, I wasn't the only person doing it. I obviously learned it from other individuals as well. So, But I'm just saying this because, remember, before everything is put uh, into a fad or a new thing and just said, everybody should do it, which I never believe in in the first place. Uh, people are already doing it in practice. So just try to, to, again, listen to somebody who's been doing it for 20, 30 years has worked with tens of thousands of people. So they've seen a lot of data. Again, it doesn't have to be me. I'm, I'm never saying that I'm saying, listen to those people. It was, it's difficult. I mean, I was in my, my twenties and I was helping people get great results, but I could have been doing that with also long-term results too. And, and so there, there is that piece to it. Um, okay. So what happens? If you find your blood sugar is elevated, especially above 100, fasted cardio in the morning, going for a jog for 20 minutes could work great to lower that blood sugar. And it does. I've now analyzed the data from my private wellness clients who have diabetes, type 1 diabetes as well, type 2. And I've analyzed the data from healthy, fit individuals that have normal blood sugar and what happens when they do cardio. So, uh, I have seen my own on Tuesday, Thursday, cardio-based workouts. When I do cardio, my blood sugar drops, okay? It does not do that when I do resistance workouts. And I track everything because, again, I'm using a continuous glucose monitor, so it tracks it 24 hours a day. So what I'm saying is keep doing your resistance training, your HIIT, your, um, your SIT training as well. But aerobic cardio, it doesn't even have to be your whole workout for the day, can be a quick way to get those blood sugar levels down. So hopefully this has been helpful. I'm happy to do follow-ups as well. Always just feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to do that. CabralSupportGroup.com is a great place to ask questions. Uh, Ask Cabral is a great place to ask questions. Uh, In the comments, whatever works for you, just let me know. So hopefully today's show was helpful. All the links will be at StephenCabral.com forward slash 2050 today. And of course, if the show was helpful, please do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve. Take care.